Lots of you will make some of the following mistakes if ever you have the misfortune of having to defend yourself or another, or prevent a crime, or even assist an officer with making an arrest. Much worse if you are called upon to defend your home. And so in this video I thought I would once again return to the law of self-defense, and one or two things that you must avoid so that you don't scupper your own defense before it gets started. So whilst of course this pertains to the law of England and Wales, it broadly applies worldwide, but make sure you do check the laws in your own jurisdiction, and of course this video cannot be taken as legal advice anyway. So with that out of the way, self-defense broadly rests on the principle of reasonable force where it has been called to be necessary to use to defend yourself, to defend another, to prevent a crime, or even to assist an officer making an arrest. It also applies when you're called upon to protect your property or property of another, such as your vehicle or your house. Self-defense and the prevention of crime also applies if you are called upon to make a lawful arrest which would include a citizen's arrest if someone has committed or is in the process of committing an indictable offence for which you can make a citizen's arrest and the law of self-defence will come in to protect you in most situations if you are then accused of causing harm to another person but treat this one with a little caution. So the law of self-defence and the defence of self-defence arises from a number of different places. It's not all in one place conveniently like certain bits of legislation are. Self-defence, the defence thereof, arises from common law but it also pops up in various bits of legislation. For example the defence of property is governed by the Criminal Damage Act of 1971 whereas arrest and the prevention of crime generally are governed by the Criminal Law Act of 1967. There is a fair amount of guidance on government websites and the essential principles of self-defence are set out in the case of Palmer of 1971, which you can also look up. This essentially provided that it is both good law and good sense that a man who is attacked may defend himself. It is both good law and good sense that he may do, but only do what is reasonably necessary. And therefore this reasonably necessary element is also relevant to the common law approach that was used in Palmer. And this is where we bring in application of section 3 of the Criminal Law Act of 1967. This provides that a person may use such force as is reasonable in the circumstances in the prevention of crime or in effecting or assisting the lawful arrest of offenders or suspected offenders or of persons unlawfully at large. So what does reasonable force mean and what does it mean when it is necessary? Well, broadly speaking, the force necessary is that required in the circumstances, but that requires somebody to believe those circumstances in the first place. This is the subjective part of the test for self-defense i.e. if the person reasonably believes that the use of force is necessary and has a genuine belief as to what those circumstances are, i.e. that a crime is taking place or they are being attacked or about to be attacked, then force is necessary and then we go on to assess whether reasonable force was used. So the sort of questions that would be asked are, was the use of force necessary in the circumstances? That's the subjective test. Was there a need for the use of any force at all? And finally, if so, was that force reasonable in all those circumstances? That is an objective test. So it isn't down to you to decide whether the force was reasonable if you are accused of causing harm to another. It is really in the minds of a magistrate or a jury as to whether or not the amount of force used was reasonable. However, this is where many of you might be concerned because what is a reasonable amount of force and how is one to decide what is a reasonable amount of force? Most of the comments in that regard that I've seen in response to videos like this are along the lines of how can somebody decide how much force is reasonable in that very moment? Well, in this case, Lord Morris said in in Palmer that if there's been an attack so that self-defense is reasonably necessary, it will be recognized that a person defending himself cannot weigh to a nicety the exact measure of his defensive action. If the jury thought that in that moment of unexpected anguish a person attacked had only done what he honestly and instinctively thought necessary, that would be the most potent evidence that a reasonable defensive action had been taken. So what do we mean by this? Well, ultimately, if a jury believes that the person only did what they instinctively thought was necessary, and honestly, in those circumstances, then this is very good evidence that they've only done what was reasonably necessary based on their belief of the circumstances at that very moment. But this is where some people do fall foul of this test. Sometimes by saying something that they don't really mean to say, but thinking that it's going to be better to say this than nothing at all. Some people, when questioned by police, having defended themselves, will say something along the lines of, he or she deserved it. 
Now, this takes out of context the real situation for which they might have used self-defence in the first place. It suggests a vengeful or prolonged attack where it wasn't reasonably necessary. On the other hand, even if you are entirely mistaken, your words are only to the extent that you genuinely believed someone was going to attack you and so you responded by defending yourself with the force that you believed was necessary in those circumstances or you just instinctively responded because you thought you were being attacked even if you were mistaken that would still be good evidence under the test of palmer in the words of lord morris that this is a reasonable action instinctively made in reasonable self-defense. One word of warning, however, this is unlikely to apply in most pub fight situations where everybody's been drinking, because a person who is voluntarily intoxicated is not going to be able to rely on a mistake of fact simply owing to the fact that they were intoxicated it's not good enough to say I thought this man was going to punch me when in fact he was just coming to the bar for another drink. There is also the distinction of householder cases i.e. someone's broken into your home and you're using self-defense in your home. These are looked at slightly differently than say out on the street or within a shop somewhere. Ordinarily for your self-defense to be reasonable force it should not be disproportionate to the circumstances that you genuinely believe them to be. However, in a householder case, this has changed somewhat significantly to be grossly disproportionate, i.e. if your actions are grossly disproportionate in a householder case where someone's broken into your house and you're defending it, then it will be taken to be more than was reasonably necessary. As a very broad example, if you were to hit somebody three or four times out in public in self-defense, that might be disproportionate and therefore not a valid self-defense. Whereas in a householder case, that might not be considered to be grossly disproportionate and and therefore might well be a valid defence. Whereas let's say if you took that several steps further, i.e. in a householder case and let's say you picked up a weapon and you continued the attack for several minutes or even longer afterwards, that is likely to be grossly disproportionate and scupper your defence of self-defence. However, it is worth saying that the householder case definition, a householder is only permitted to rely on this heightened defence for householders in accordance with section 76 of the Criminal Justice and Immigration Act of 2008. Specifically, a house Householder is only permitted to rely on this heightened defence, i.e. the grossly disproportionate meaning of the wording, if they are using force to defend themselves or others, that's under section 8a, i.e. they cannot seek to rely on this defence if they are acting for any other purpose, such as protecting the property. Although the law on reasonable force continues to apply in those situations, but just not this heightened level of the defense. Secondly, they must be in, or at least partly in, the building, or part of a building, such as a flat that is a dwelling. I know some of you live in vehicles and caravans and motorhomes, vehicles and vessels or boats. And so for these purposes, the definition of a building is taken to include all of those. So people, for example, living on a houseboat can benefit from this heightened protection if you are defending yourself whilst living on a boat or some other vehicle. One or two other questions that frequently pop up are about preemptive strikes. There is no law or rule to say that a person must wait to be hit first before they act in self-defense. Secondly, the law of retreating. A failure to retreat or run away when attacked, when it's safe and possible to do so, is not conclusive evidence that a person was not acting in self-defense. It's just one of those factors to be taken into account, i.e. If they could have run away, then that might be taken into account, but it's not automatically to say that they were not acting in self-defense. There are also questions about revenge. Now, this is a very, very difficult one because I would always recommend that people do not act in revenge. However, in the case of Crown and Rashford of 2005, it was held that the mere fact that a defendant went somewhere to exact revenge from the victim did not rule out the possibility that in any violence that ensued thereafter, self-defense was necessarily unavailable as a defense but this always depends on the circumstances so i would certainly not rely on the defense of self-defense being available if you sought out revenge finally many people do ask about the use of self-defense when accused of causing harm when exacting a citizen power of arrest now as i've spoken about the citizen power of arrest before this is found in section 24a of pace 1984 members of the public other than constables may arrest for indictable offenses that is one that can be heard on indictment, which includes either way offences because it could be heard in the Magistrates Court or it could go to the Crown Court. That makes it an indictable offence, not to be confused with a summary only offence.
Naturally, this would require you in advance to know that the offence being committed was an indictable offence, which many of them are, but not all of them, so you do need to be careful. Because there are two conditions which must apply for a citizen's arrest. That there are reasonable grounds to believe that an arrest is necessary for a reason specified, and it is not reasonably practicable for a constable to make the arrest. In other words, if there's a police officer around, it shouldn't be you that's doing it. The reasons specified would include whether the person is causing physical injury injury to himself or another person, suffering a physical injury, causing loss or damage to property, so this could include somebody damaging your vehicle for example because criminal damage is an either way of fence, or, which is probably a common one, making off before a constable can assume responsibility. In other words, you can make this citizen's arrest to keep the person there until a police officer arrives. Strictly speaking, you should be taking them directly to a police station, but in practice you would be calling the police to get them to come and take them away. However, all of this comes with a very broad warning, because any use of force used to effect an arrest may be an assault and may be unlawful. Unless, of course, the amount of force used was necessary and reasonable for all the reasons specified. Any force used to resist the arrest may be lawful, in fact, and this was decided in Crown and Self. However, as a very interesting twist in Crown and Lee, it was held that when a defendant was charged with assault with intent to resist arrest, it was irrelevant whether the defendant honestly believed that the arrest was lawful. Members of the public, as well as police officers, may take action, including the reasonable force, to prevent breach of the peace, which would not necessarily involve exercising formal powers of arrest. So as a very broad warning to all of this, I would say exercise extreme caution before getting involved in any kind of citizen's arrest, because if you get it wrong, it will be you that's accused of assault, and it may well be unlawful. So unless you really know what you're doing, because you've looked this up in advance and you know that you're capable of using reasonable force in those circumstances, if I were you, I would be steering clear. Someone such as myself, who is a practicing barrister, knows the law very well. I'm a trained martial arts expert. I can use a very precise amount of force that is only reasonably necessary. And if ever I were called upon to justify my use of force, I can say that in all my 30 something years of training in martial arts, being a sixth dan and teaching for so many years, including the army, I could quite easily justify and establish that I've only used the amount of force that was absolutely necessary. So I hope that served to address some of the questions and helps you to avoid saying something that steps you outside of the law when you may not intend to. Because many people will say something that they think is appropriate even if it wasn't really the truth and in doing so actually scupper their own defence when it might otherwise have been perfectly valid. So if you found this video useful please do like the video, please do share it with somebody, make sure you're subscribed and as always thank you for watching.